Now joining me at the London Podcast Studios, it's Liz Howell. Hello. Hello. Lovely to see you in person. Uh, now we'll talk about ITV more in a minute uh, with everyone, but as an experienced TV exec and someone who had your own breakfast fun when, when you were do, doing GMTV. What is your take on, on this morning? Well, it's very interesting, isn't it? In fact, I was on the commissioning panel for this morning, way back <laughs> in the 1980s when they got the gig at Granada. I think that, in fact, ITV have handled this quite well. Mm. They've been very quiet, and I think they were very dignified at the hearing. And it, they made some very sensible points. For example, there have been very few complaints at ITV about the mm. so-called toxic environment. I have to say, I don't really agree with Martin Frizzell about fruit and veg and things, but I am a little bit sick of hearing the word toxic. Yes. You know, what does it really mean? I mean, if talent's a, a complex thing. We, we, we've talked a little bit about, about the, the Philip Schofield issue before, but um, when you're sort of in the editor's chair or when, when you have to look after what are quite large teams um, dealing with little talent flare-ups, mm-hmm. there isn't a book to tell you what to do, is there? No, there isn't. And every single programme that's successful has difficult times there's jealousies and resentments and there's people who think they should be promoted and they're not promoted and people who get promoted beyond their ability and it's difficult it's a high risk high reward business Mm. and that's what you go into and you know that when you you go into it and that's part of the fun and part of the excitement you know you can rise to the top and you can fall an awful long way as I know from personal (laughs) experience but Uh. So I, I think they've handled it very well. I, I, I keep wanting to say to these people that are quizzing them, these rather pompous MPs and so on, what should they have done? Yes. What should ITV have done? Should they have followed Philip Schofield home? And then if they'd found out that he was having an affair with a younger person, what would they have done? Yes. Make him give him up? Uh, it's so complicated and difficult, and I do get really sick of all the hypocrisy and the self-righteousness. Well, let's talk a bit more about um, that select committee in a little while. Um, before we get there, though, um, someone who's making their media podcast debut, it's our second guest, the head of podcast Intelligence Squared, Farah Jassat. Hello. Hi, Matt. Nice to be here. Uh, it's lovely to have you here. Um, you've been busy launching a new podcast. Yes, we're launching a new podcast today, in fact. It's called Versus, and it's hosted by Coco Khan. The Guardian journalist, who you may also have heard on Pod Save the UK. Yeah, she's made it. She's made an excellent appearance on Pod Save the UK, and she's absolutely fantastic. And she's posting our first series of verses, which is a podcast all about the little debates that are a big deal to someone. Okay, so what what's a little debate? So our first episode that's out today is cars versus bikes. And we have two engineers uh, debating it, but in a fun way. So we've got Yasmin Abdul Majid and Roma Agrawal. They're both engineers. Uh, we've got other episodes like The Beatles versus The Rolling Stones. We've got London versus New York. That one includes the mooch, Anthony Scaramucci against Simon Jenkins of The Guardian. Um, so it's kind of fun takes, fun topics, but you'll learn something from it. Have there been any punch ups uh, from it already? Well, I have to leave that for you to listen to. I mean, I'm going to keep you in suspense. <laughs> That's good. Verses available wherever you're listening to this. Um, OK, so story number one, um, we've touched on it already. Uh, TV chiefs in the dock. Uh, so not one, but two TV bosses were interviewed by MPs in Westminster this week. Uh, the BBC's Tim Davey uh, and ITV's Carolyn McCall both spoke to the DCMS uh, Select Committee. They do love dragging a media person in front of them. They uh, do. Don't they, Liz? They really do. And I think that there is an element of sort of enjoying it. And somebody who's in the business said to me the other day, MPs, what right have they got (laughs) to quiz ITV or media about its moral stance? Is that because we give them such a hard time? We give them a hard time, but they deserve it often. And, you know, they are elected representatives and they should... Well, we all know what's going on at the moment. So, Well, Tim Davey, he was defending BBC cuts, particularly to local radio. Yeah. Um, a 30% of income gone over 10 years at the BBC, mm. plus inflation at 10%. Uh, how, did he, how did he do? Did you see him perform? Yes, and I think he did quite well. But the trouble is that local radio is a very emotive thing. Mm. And people get terribly worked up about it. And, and MPs love local radio because it's a platform for them. They're never off it. Well, they need to be on it, don't they? That's, yeah, they love they it. They get rid of that. But I've just been looking at some figures, which I think are really interesting. So BBC local radio costs £124 million, mm. And it's got 7.78 million listeners. So Radio 4, for example, costs £96 million and has 10 million listeners. But of those 10 million listeners, six and a half million, just about, tune in for the Today programme. So for the rest of the channel, there's really only three and three quarter million. So in a way, why skimp on local radio and maintain Radio 4, which without the Today programme has only half the listeners of BBC local radio? 
Of course, this is because of the snob element in London and people who think that local radio, just by definition, must be naff. But I came up with an idea that perhaps you could keep the Today programme and then put out all the rest of the the, the feed, as, as it mm. were, to the local radio stations who could pick and mix from the Radio 4 programmes that they like or think are relevant. I just thought it would be interesting to turn it on its head. Why should local radio suffer and Radio 4 carry on when it's really only the Today programme that counts on Radio 4 in any that's quite that's, quite, that's quite a statement to make. Well, it's interesting, isn't it? It turns it on its head. Of course, I started in local radio. Where, where were you? It's great. Radio Leeds. And uh, back in the day, it was quite hard to, to get a job. And I did write to them asking if I could go for an internship. But there's no such thing as an internship then. And we didn't even have that language. I just asked <laughs> if I could hang around. And they said, well, we are interviewing for a receptionist. So I went along to be interviewed as a receptionist. And when I got there, I said, well, I don't really want to be a receptionist. And, but I could only work on a, a Saturday. I used to do something called the Saturday show at first. But it was a, a really great place to work. And there was a very, very loyal following. And that, I think, is what they're in danger of, of losing. Uh, far do you think uh, the BBC are uh, underestimating their own uh, local broadcasting? I think they are absolutely. I mean, I think local radio is one of the USPs of the BBC. I mean, it's a public service broadcaster. This is one of the things in their charter that they can do that commercial rivals can't do in the same way. And, you know, the key with local radio is that it's local programming made by local presenters for local people. So audiences are hugely loyal and you know you'll have people listening for decades to the same person you know feeling a real companionship a real sense of community and decimating local radio in the same way that's happened with the world service and those communities around the world is going to have an impact that we'll only probably realize many years down the road and so it's it's this obsession isn't it with getting young cool people and they're not going to listen to local well, the, radio the, the, but... the bbc would probably say uh, the bbc across all of its channels caters very well for older audiences a very high proportion of older people listen to and watch bbc programs whereas at the younger end it's much more difficult yeah, well, so... why, why throw them overboard but are they, are they really throwing them overboard? They're not saying there's nothing for them to consume. Well, actually, Matt, they are throwing them overboard because one of the really silly things about this scheme is the idea that if you're in uh, Radio Cumbria, for example, you can take a programme from Manchester in the morning and from Newcastle in the afternoon. People in Cumbria hate that. They want to be Cumbrians and listen to Cumbrian material. But Radio 2 is probably more successful than BBC Radio Cumbria in that market. Well, it probably is, and it's probably national, and Radio 2 is a different matter. I was comparing with Radio 4. But even Radio 2 isn't that much more popular proportionally. So why not have a situation where you have ra local radio still making local programmes with local people and not have this sort of fudge where you have regions that don't really count as regions being artificially put together and put Radio 2 on in the afternoon? Well, if we talk about um, age groups, there was an interesting thing that came up in this select committee discussion. Uh, this was Tim Davey saying that most 16 to 34 year olds uh, don't believe that any media is impartial. Um, there's obviously a lot of impartiality talked about the BBC. I mean, Farah, it's uh, an interesting challenge for the BBC and all broadcasters about what young audiences think about media, particularly when they consume so much of it digitally or, or through social. Yeah, absolutely. I think, you know, this notion of impartiality is maybe a notion of a bygone age. I mean, most people going forward feel more trust when they when they know which position a broadcaster is coming from or, or a news outlet. I mean... My background's at the BBC, I was at Newsnight for many years. I believe in the, you know, the aim of impartiality, but I also believe that it's probably, you know, an unachievable goal and you will all you can always aim to be as impartial as you can. But, you know, people come from different perspectives and from different backgrounds and there's no harm in actually just being able to admit that. I think I can really see where you're coming from, although as a journalism teacher, I always teach objectivity and impartiality. But perhaps but are they two different things? They are. And I think it's a question of, of honesty. If you mm. know where a person's coming from, that's what matters. And I think that was very interesting in the, in the Gary Lineker case, for example, where it, I didn't have any problem at all with Gary Lineker not on air, giving his personal opinion. The same with Jeremy Clarkson, for example. He was really unpleasant about Meghan Merkel. But I'm glad that I know that about him because it put me right off. And I know the truth about Jeremy Clarkson. So it's a complicated thing. But 
I think if you've got objectivity, then you can rely on the broadcaster to tell you both sides of the story or all the truth. Uh, well, the other people that were facing a grilling were ITV's Carolyn McCall and Kevin Ligo, who sort of heads up kind of content and programming, facing a grilling from the MPs. Liz, I mean, oh. w- when I saw, when I was watching that, um, some of Kevin Ligo's uh, statements were pretty good. I mean, he's a, he's a good speaker anyway. Yeah, and he didn't, I he thought didn't... all three of them were, were really good. I was a little bit confused about Carolyn McCall when she was talking about... Um, defamatory or otherwise statements and then said well we don't mention that having just mentioned it <laughs> which was either very clever or a bit odd I was just hoping a bit annoyed yes I think very annoyed because I, I can absolutely see why they're so annoyed these people making these allegations they've done as I said their investigation what are they supposed to do anyway they can't put the thumb screws on these people and you know all right Philip Schofield may have pulled the wool over their eyes. But if he wasn't doing anything illegal, then really it puts them in a very difficult position well, anyway. Kevin Ligo said he, he spoke to Schofield just before he was about yeah. to come out on, yeah. on television. And, and there's been a lot of discussion about why he chose that moment. Mm. And Kevin said, he said to Philip, mm. is there anything you want to tell me that we should know that has prompted this? Uh, and Schofield reportedly said, no, there's nothing. I mean, and they had an... an I think they asked 12 times. Mm-hmm, the, 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 what are they the supposed to do? Mm. Go on and on and on, you know, put them on the rack. It's, it's absolutely ludicrous. And there are real complications here. If a person is in their 20s, at what point do they take responsibility anyway? And in many of these relationships, it's the younger person that's got what you might call the whip hand, you know, they've got the power in the relationship. So it's enormously complicated. And I have said this before, but I think it's so good I'll say it again. (laughs) What are they going to have? A situation where a senior producer can only sleep with an executive producer or a reporter can sleep with a producer, but a producer can't sleep with a runner. A runner can't sleep with a cleaner, but the cleaner can sleep with the executive producer. Where is it going to end? Are we going to have guidelines for, you know, who goes with who in the green room? It's crazy. I mean, I wouldn't quite agree with that the younger people might have the whip hand over older people in this situation, obviously. No, but no, Skokul had an immense amount yeah. of power in the programme. Yeah, sorry, can and I just say, I do agree in this situation, it's obviously perhaps abuse of power may be going too far, but certainly inappropriate. Yeah, but I do think, you know, it is a very difficult situation for ITV to be in. As you say, you know, they ask, you know, people 10 to 12 times mm-hmm. about this. And if you've not got evidence, what can you do? I mean, Liz, I mean, Kevin also said that a lot of the people that are slagging off ITV are the ones that previously they had a lovely time there and were mm. very happy to stay on the network. Well, I'm not going to argue with that. <laughs> Uh, another story this week uh, is Ofcom. Uh, they're looking into the rising trend of news interviews anchored by MPs, uh, such as Jacob Rees-Mogg and Nadine Dorries. Yes, she's still an MP at the time of recording anyway, um, uh, appearing on, on Talk TV. Um, I mean, we, Farah, we talked about this... The, the, this challenge of impartiality. I mean, actually, if you're an MP of a political party, you know where they are. Is it fine for them actually to, to be on uh, to be on television uh, interviewing people or uh, having an opinion? I think it's fine for them to have opinions, but I think there's a real problem when you have shows uh, such as the shows that are on GB News, where you have a politician from a certain party interviewing other politicians mm. from the same party with no other views. Therefore, there's no range of views and there's no objectivity or impartiality there. So Ofcom would argue, well, it's current affairs, it's not news, so that's OK. I think Ofcom is fudging it completely here. I think they're late to the party and they've, they've been a bit toothless over this issue, frankly, because their quick bling over format, this mm. is the current affairs programme, therefore impartiality rules don't count, it's not a news programme, but they base these things on format, which is, is a presenter speaking to the audience, is there a reporter segment, are there VTs in, in the package? You know, I mean, I don't think that looks at the principle behind due impartiality, which is the whole point of it. I mean, as far as right, I mean, Ofcom, have, have maybe Ofcom has been fortunate that traditional broadcasters have, have played a straight bat and the same game for so long uh, and that GB News and Talk TV are sort of following the rules uh, wow. but it just doesn't seem it doesn't seem right well I think with GB News they really like um, poking the bars of the cage with Ofcom mm. it gets them lots of publicity they're a tiny little outfit really I mean they must think all the birthdays have come at once with, with Eamon and all the stuff at the moment but anyway on on top of that they like controversy they caught it and they always say rather grandly we chose to be on tv than being online the fact is they get far more publicity because they're on 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 tv and it's also more their target audience so they're poking the bars there a bit with with ofcom i've actually got the ofcom ofcom guidelines yes read it out for us 
So item 5.3 says that no politician may be used as a newsreader, interviewer or reporter in any news programme unless, exceptionally, it is editorially justified. In that case, the political allegiance of that person must be made clear to the audience. It's really not a very good guideline, <laughs> is it? For a start, what's the difference? A news programme and a current affairs programme which is going to, say, take a news flash. Yes. You know, which, and one of the things everybody criticised about GB News when it started was it didn't have any news. Mm. So they've got news you know, between the programmes and so on, and um, or at the top of the programme. So does that make it a, a news programme? It's complicated, isn't it? And when they say, well, it's editorially justified, you know, our presenters are brilliant, everyone's talking politics and we can use their views and it's fine editorially. So it's really very difficult for Ofcom. They also say in, in item 5.5, due impartiality on matters of political or industrial controversy and matters relating to current public policy, so this would be the, the junior doctors, for mm. example, must be preserved on the part of any person providing a service. So this could be achieved within a programme or over a series of programmes. If you have got a politician presenting a programme and consistently being the presenter, you cannot do that because they're going to have a partial view. I mean, has, has radio actually done this much better? So LBC was always sort of held up and occasionally pointed out for, for doing something wrong. But they look like they're, they're heavenly in, in comparison to maybe uh, well, they're, talk they're, TV. Well, their chat programmes are, are very much chat programmes and mm. its personalities. And what they do is have a opposing politicians mm. and that's the dynamics and it's quite fun and quite exciting and it's also clearly a current affairs program in the middle of the day usually so I, I totally agree with Farah I think it's very confusing I sort of feel a bit sorry for of course it's a tough call but they've got to clarify this and they're going to do it by some sort of survey and see what we all think oh. uh, Farah they're going to uh, talk to people and, and, tr and try and get a view to sort of outsource the decision making somewhat uh, to the outside world there's a bit of me that looks at this and the sort of the grumpy people the people who've, who've been around in news for, for quite a long time um, actually does it open up opportunities for, for BBC ITV and, and channel for to, to rethink perhaps some of the ways that they put together their news and current affairs programmes? I mean, it can do, but ultimately I think that the main issue here is that Ofcom has certain rules in place mm. and now, as you said, they are outsourcing it rather than enforcing their own rules or clarifying their own rules. I mean, a, a case in point that you were just talking about was, you know, the was it Esther McVeigh interviewing um, Chancellor Jeremy Hunt mm. about the budget. <laughs> You know, I mean, yeah. it's just incredible. I want Nadine Doris interviewing Boris Johnson. I would say it was a bit of a party, but that's too controversial. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> but then you could argue that the audience are entirely aware of, of, of their political standing. Uh, they understand where, where they're coming from. We, we talked about it earlier as well. Um, yeah, maybe th there's a certain honesty. As long as it's not in the news context. And that's mm. the difficulty about something like talking about the budget, where it's a news item, news of the day thing. So I think it, it's a really difficult situation and it's got it's got to be resolved. I did do something for, for Times Radio mm. recently, which was about politicians doing pieces to camera, as we call them in TV. You know where the presenter, the, sorry, the reporter talks to the camera. And they had some hysterical examples. And one was Jeremy Hunt trying to explain, I think it was inflation with coffee cups. <laughs> it was so patronising and awful. And what struck me was that why do these politicians want to be entertainers? They're mm. politicians. But then, well, that, that goes back to ego, doesn't it? Like, to, to be an MP, you need a decent amount of ego, and being a, a telly performer well, is, is similar. But Just, that's what one, some of the people are saying. Yeah. If Ofcom tightens its rules, uh, politicians may have to choose between TV and Westminster. They may well, have shock, to quit being shock an MP. Horror. But just to be super topical, mm. Glenda Jackson, who's just, yes, died, just died, apparently yeah. said this really funny thing about being in the House of Commons it was really just like acting, except the lighting <laughs> was rubbish and it was rather under-rehearsed. You know, my real worry about this situation with um, impartiality is that, you know, we could be unwittingly going into a Fox News style environment in the UK. And that is the real problem where, you know, for so many decades, we've had these rules of due impartiality in broadcasting. Mm. And almost by stealth, the rules have changed without anyone realising. Um, and, you know, we're going to end up in an American style polarised news environment. And that is my concern. Uh, just on that, Liz, uh, I mean, Fox News is hugely successful. It's the most popular cable network um, out of all of them, not even just in news. I mean, these channels, GB News and, and Talk TV, they're not successful. Well, they're not in the same league, obviously, mm. but it has occurred to me that perhaps the idea behind GB News is to edge more and more towards Fox because Fox is successful, but not on a broad spectrum. It's successful with a very small targeted audience, which is enormously loyal. So it's a bit like saying there's, all right, for the sake of a better 
word. There's a lot of odd people out there with crazy views, but they're a market. Mm. They still buy, I don't know, nappies and jam and things. So we can still sell advertising and absolutely feast on the fact that they've got these crazy views. And that's really the business plan behind Fox News now. Whereas I'm not sure that GB News is really ready for that, but it might be the route it's going down. And that might be part of the whole, you know, poking through the bars of Ofcom's cage. And over the next few years, I mean, you know, Boris has just stepped down. Is Boris going to get a programme on Talk TV? I mean, I think there's a lot of, you know, potential. He'll probably start his own channel or he might buy the Telegraph. Who knows? Oh, dear. Uh, Well, whether you're odd or not, stick around. We've got more news after this. And we're back with the media podcast. Liz and Farah are still with me. Time for some news in brief. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, uh, you may have seen a BBC interview with a pretty controversial figure, Andrew Tate, uh, recorded whilst he is under house arrest in Romania uh, for numerous charges, including rape, human trafficking and exploiting women. Um, Farah, the BBC's interview was edited and then shortly afterwards, Tate or his sort of social media people released that their sort of own cut. Um, to, to tell if, you, if people aren't aware of that story, tell us what happened. Yeah, so uh, the BBC's Lucy Williamson interviewed Andrew Tate at his house because he's currently under house arrest, as you say, for many charges, including human trafficking and rape. So as soon as she walked in, Lucy Williamson, Andrew Tate's people were filming the encounter until she sat down the whole interview until she left the house. It was about 40 something minutes. Mm. The BBC obviously recorded the interview itself and then put out an edited version of just under nine minutes. So this has caused a lot of controversy with people online saying, you know, why has the BBC done that? They're trying to hide something. And the problem with this is that it's become a very polarised, it was always going to be a polarised issue. You are interviewing Andrew Tate. Now, his followers are always going to say that the BBC is going to do a hit job on Mm. him, which they are saying already. I think that uh, Lucy actually did really well in that interview. I mean, it was a very difficult interview to have. But, you know, if we compare it to other interviews in the past, like, say, the Elon Musk interview, Mm. uh, which was done by a great reporter, James Clayton. I used to work with him at Newsnight. But, you know, Elon gave very little notice. It was a last minute interview. Yes, he seemed a little underprepared. He was a bit underprepared. Mm. It was very last minute. And you could see he was a bit caught out uh, as Elon tried to turn the tables on him and ask Mm. him questions. Now, I think Lucy was very aware of this strategy. And so I was quite impressed. Although I sat, I watched this interview kind of at one o'clock in the morning because I only meant to watch the first few minutes and then I just got obsessed. It's one of those things, I don't want to be interested in this story, but I have this morbid fascination like with cults and, you know, with Andrew Tate. So um, I think she did really well. You know, what she did was quietly, consistently repeat her questions and she was armed with facts, even when he was, you know, saying, no, I didn't say that, even though there's Mm. evidence that he Mm. did say that. Or you've made up this person who's a witness, um, which they haven't made up, you know, I mean, I, I, to be honest, my heart was beating really fast. I felt palpitations. Mm. I would be incredibly nervous at being the interviewer with someone like him. Well, sort of from the audience perspective, this kind of combines media literacy with um, uh, being in your own sort of silo of, of, of news, bit of Trumpism as well, or just, or, or, or just lying. Uh, I mean, Liz, if you if you're a broadcaster, uh, is there something we should learn from this and say actually should we put up all the rushes? Should we should we have something for the ten o'clock news and just go look? We're, we're trying to be open and honest. Here is everything that happened. I think you've got to be quite careful because sometimes there are things which both sides would want to have edited out. But um, the program about. Brown and Blair that was on TV quite recently was wonderful because it showed them sitting down and preparing for the interviews and in a way that was unfair but in a way it was incredibly telling. They seem like real people. Yeah and yes and they'll let slip certain things that they don't do in the interview and so on and and of course I'm sure there was waivers and and they had to give permissions and so on but it really did work as a very interesting show. With Tate I thought what was so amazing was that he came over as so absolutely terrible and that wasn't because um, Lucy was giving him the opportunity to be, to be absolutely terrible she was really sort of countering him and so on and, and and she was giving him a way out on occasions but he was absolutely awful and really it was it was unbelievably interesting to watch just to answer your question about media literacy we've got so many platforms now I can't see any reason why much longer versions shouldn't be put up or the whole of the version put up and we go back to Philip Schofield and Amal Rajan. Mm. There were the, the headlines put on the news programmes and then there was the full-length interview which did have other insights in it. So no reason why not at all. But it will get into a different type of negotiation with the interviewee. That's the thing, that the permissions will have to be different. 
I think Tate absolutely hung himself in that interview and I think she did very well and it was really telling. The Musk interview made me cringe, I'm afraid. I mean, there is a question about um, that comes up whenever these people are interviewed about whether they should be platformed or not. Uh, same, with, same with Trump and we've talked about the, the CNN town hall. Uh, should they have let him be on, be on live television? Mm. Should these people be platformed? I think it's a really difficult question. I mean, with Tate in particular, I think the the police uh, in Bucharest came out saying that um, why has the BBC given him VIP treatment because mm. he's under active investigation? Mm. Um, and, you know, maybe there is a case there. I mean, what are we going to learn from someone like Andrew Tate that he's not already said? I didn't feel we learned much but, from that but, interview. No, no I disagree. But as Liz was saying, I when think, you suddenly see that there is yeah. there is nothing... There is nothing really there. I think we learned that he is as bad as we've been led to believe because I was thinking he can't be that bad and I want to hear his side of the story. And I'm glad I did because it was horrible and now I know he's horrible. I guess you're right. You know, someone like me, I will actually go on social media and look at his stuff and I'll know that. But lots of people won't know. Mm. They'll just hear about him. And this is the only way that they'll actually that's, be able to see right. him That's right. I have not had time in my life to go and research <laughs> Andrew Tate. But I was absolutely fascinated when he turned up on the news. But some, so, but some of these demagogues, um, they they don't have to be on traditional media because they've got large audiences themselves. But this and, gets, so, and so but, suddenly when they are faced with it, it doesn't really work for them. But that gets right back to our imp- impartial or objective stance, which is when they come up against somebody that's going to fight them, they really don't like it. And it's it's quite entertaining to see how they react. Well, he doesn't like it so much that I didn't know if you I don't know if you saw earlier this week. He's been discrediting Lucy. Yes. I'm really sorry for her. On his social media, he's been saying that she's in love with him, totally obsessed <laughs> with him. Well, that and they, says everything. They about put him. up a video of her basically doorstepping him on the street, with some love music in the background and some love heart emojis over her face. Uh, oh dear, oh dear. But I'm glad she did it, aren't you? No, definitely. Uh, well, something that came up this week uh, was the Reuters Digital News Report, and it shared some interesting research into the top 10 news podcasts in the UK. Uh, Farah, did you see who was at the top of the list? I think it was Newscast. Was it BBC Newscast? Yeah, so three podcasts sort of tied for the top. So News Agents, uh, Rest is Politics, um, and BBC Newscast. Uh, why do we think those three shows are at the top of the tree? I mean, they're great political analysis shows, they're chat shows, you know who the hosts are, they chat to each other and they've all got deep dives. You know, the rest is politics, two former political insiders, the news agent, you've got Emily Maitlis, John Sopel and Lewis Goodall, experienced journalists that have been around for many years. And uh, Newscast, which has got a great format, which they've replicated over things like Brexit Cast, Ukraine Cast, AmeriCast. So I think that, you know, people are interested in learning about the news from people that are, you know, chatting about it yeah i think this is really interesting because there there is this current tendency to have things explained to you and i i don't like that and i know other people find it uncomfortable because there's a sort of assumption that you you don't really know what's going on and it's going to be explained to you you've got to be you've got to be really into it if you download a podcast haven't you well you have but also even when you don't go that deep it's great to have the feeling that you're being talked to as an equal, intelligent person. And that's why I like Chris Mason, and I think he'd be a great podcaster when mm. he gets, needs to get another job. I hope not for a long, long time. <laughs> because I get the feeling that he's giving me that insider thing. I don't want someone to explain. I want somebody to let me in and give me those juicy bits that maybe, you know, I wouldn't know about ordinarily. And that's what I think works in the best sort of podcast, the idea that somebody's saying something that they, perhaps they wouldn't say in another environment. I mean, I, I don't know about you, Farah, but I feel much more comfortable and more honest and open chatting away here than on some of the media I've done recently where it's very formal. So things do slip out and you do have a little bit more of a relationship with the audience and you do tell tell them things so like the receptionist at Radio Leeds story <laughs> but there you go and it, it makes it more alive I was interested in that report though Matt about how you know programs like Today in Focus mm. which is a brilliant program that does sort of deep dives so this, is, this, is, very... this, this is the Guardian's uh, uh, daily podcast yes it? the Guardian's daily podcast mm. that does sort of deep dives into issues I think it's a great podcast um, but you know they didn't do as well as maybe they're the wrong sort of issues well, it seems that the, the report's saying that many people are not interested in deep dives in the UK. Um, there were some interesting statistics. I think it's only 8% of um, UK audience that listens to news podcasts. Yes, it was. It was, And it was disappointing in terms of the whole audience. And they were just comparing 
in a very small area. But I think that that could be to do with the nature of podcasts in that you, you do want entertainment value as well. And you're perhaps needing, needing your podcast when you're doing something else and you need to be engaged in a way that perhaps asking you to sit down and concentrate on a deep dive doesn't work. But I mean, compares- I listen to podcasts when I'm doing something else. Is that mm. is that? I think a lot of people do it in the same way they listen to the radio. Yeah, exactly. Um, in that it accompanies them on, on their day. Yeah, absolutely. But in the US, um, news podcasts account for about 19% of listens. So over double the amount of listens in the UK proportionally. I think that might be cultural because there is an obsession in the, in the US with p- being deceived. People feel there are conspiracies and that terrible things are happening and they don't really know about them. And they go into podcasts wanting to know the truth. I don't think we are quite so paranoid yet in the uh, UK. One of the things I thought about those sort of three winners uh, were, that were shows that um, well, particularly if we look at uh, newscasts and the news agents that are visualised, that have big social media output and, and following. Uh, do you think that's essential for, for shows to be successful? I think in this day and age, it's becoming increasingly important. You know, there are lots of people. I mean, I get the news agent uh, clips on my TikTok mm. and loads of people watch those clips, but don't actually listen to the news agents. Mm. Does it matter? I don't think it necessarily matters. Because they, they, they are, I mean, it matters in terms of monetization yeah. for the news agents themselves. Yeah. Yeah. The more people that listen to it, the more, you know, the more money they'll make. That's exactly what I was going to say, because monetization of podcasts still confuses me. I don't understand how they necessarily make money. Well, Liz, you can go to patreon.com slash yeah, uh, yeah. media podcast. But, but seriously, is it going to be something that, that I wouldn't say is a flash in the pan, because it's mm. obviously not going to be. But if you can't monetize it, what's, where's it going to go? It reminds me a little bit of the early days of, of the internet, and I did get involved in having a, a small business which was online, and it was impossible to monetize it. We had, at one point, thousands of people coming into to this particular website, but there was no way before PayPal, really, of getting any money out of it. So it, in the end, it had to go. I mean, lots of publishers are finding this a, a challenge, aren't they? I mean, some publishers have had three or four audio strategies. Um, and for Intelligence Squared, you know, it's a combination, isn't it, of an events business and um, exactly. a, a, a membership business. That's why it's so Absolutely. clever. Absolutely. Yeah. So with the podcast side of the business, you know, you can get you can monetize it through adverts on the on the on the program, but mm-hmm. also through membership, you know, where people get extra content. So in a way, subscription is going, Sub- to, subscri- subscription is going to be the model. But also that's that's why having a really strong connection with your audience is essential because you want to convert them into being subscribers and, and not just passive consumers. So really, if you have a sort of a very narrow thing that people are very dedicated to and will pay, then you're going to make money with your podcast. Because I've got a friend who wants to do a church music podcast maybe that's not such a daft well, idea if, if you fi- find the audience i think one of the challenges is you've got to be able to tell them that you exist uh, so where do those people go what do they consume that you can go well by the way mm-hmm. there's this great church music podcast that, that you could tune because podcast discovery is still um, a troublesome thing for for any new show mm-hmm. absolutely as we'll know with verses <laughs> <laughs> available, so, no, it sounds available, available wherever you, you podcast. i'm already very worked up about bikes versus cars <laughs> and new york versus london oh no beatles versus the stones it's so obviously the beatles the, one thing i was going to say about you know the top three podcasts and i'm not just saying this because coco is the host on verses mm. but actually i really think pod save the uk is going to be rising up the charts over the next couple of months Uh, especially in the run-up to the general election. And I wouldn't be surprised if in one of the next reports, you know, that's towards the top of the list. Well, so Post Save the UK um, have to to declare some interest in um, we're doing some work and helping them do some of the marketing. I mean, it's quite interesting. Well, it's working. Well, thank you. (laughs) Uh, What I think is quite interesting about Pod Save the UK is it it has an opinion. You know, it is more of a left-wing show. Uh, They're not insiders. A lot of political podcasts, they're insiders or mates of insiders. And I think when that show... Uh, got established in one of that big big discussions you know it, it was a spin-off of pod save america you know consummate insiders there used to be obama's um uh, speech writing team uh, so with this it was like do we do we put with niche a load of insiders or actually do we occupy the position of the audience are we outsiders uh, looking in and i think it's going to be fascinating how that sits alongside those shows uh, but also i think for all politics podcasts if we go into a change of government um will they all have a little bit of a, a bit of a drop have we been lucky uh, to have the the tory party collapse i mean it is really hello or okay politics at the moment isn't it it's sort of become almost like crazy celebrity life and it's fascinating on a gossip level i think you're right when things calm down 
will people want to go into it in quite the same way? Uh, well, the ultimate podcast format that I'm still surprised hasn't been spun off into its own uh, global uh, successful subscription podcast is the Media Quiz, uh, <laughs> which this week is entitled... That's because I always lose. That's why it hasn't. Well, we'll, we'll say to you this week. It's uh, entitled, Give Us a News Clue. Give us a news clue. Uh, I'll give you a clue that hints at a media story from the week. Uh, the less clues you need, the more points you get. Oh, God, I've got to add up points as well. Uh, but if you buzz and get it wrong, you're locked out. Jeez, how many format points are in this? I'm going to say that again. So there's there's, there's clues, uh, hints from media story of the week. The less clues you need, the more points you get. Uh, but if you buzz in and wrong, you're out. But okay. how do you buzz in? You buzz in with your name. Oh, so, I uh, get that wrong. So Liz, you'll say... Liz. Uh, Farah, you'll say? Farah. Right, here we go. Uh, number one. Uh, clue number one. It's good news for West Yorkshire, Dundee and Belfast. Okay, for two points. They're getting government funding. Oh, oh, um, oh is it AI? Uh, oh, Liz. Uh, Liz. Is it about AI and, and uh, investment in AI? It is. Sort of. Um, yes, the government is investing almost £150 million in a network of research labs across the country tasked with developing the next generation of special effects using tech such as artificial intelligence. That's according to The Guardian. So two points to you um, uh, for getting it on, on that, that second clue. Well done. Uh, right, question number two. Um, for three points, it's Formula One with a ball... Ooh, Farah. Oh, Farah. Yes. <laughs> is it Netflix entering the live sports space? It is. Uh, they're in talks to live stream their first sporting event. I think it sounded quite a good idea. Sort of a celebrity golf tournament featuring golfers and F1 drivers. God, I can't imagine anything worse. Uh, but it sort of combines doing something live, doing sport with sort yeah. of celebrity. If you put them together, I wouldn't have to watch them at all. Would, uh, it? would it be something that you'll um, you'll click on? Not personally, but I think, you know, for Netflix, it's quite an interesting move for them to make to go into this sort of live sports space and to experiment with something that's a little bit low risk here. It's not, you know, a household event. And there's yeah, definitely yeah. some some rumours they were they were into bid for things like Formula One that yeah. they, they found too expensive. I mean, if you can't if you can't buy it, create something new. I this guess. isn't really live sports streaming. Though, is it? This is an <laughs> entertainment show. And I think it's quite ingenious. Uh, right. So uh, th uh, three points uh, so far, uh, two for you, Liz. So it's probably on this one. Uh, Question, question oh, number no. three. Uh, three points. It could be you, but certainly not Paddy Power. King George the Sixth Chase could make King's Cross. For two points. And three. Don't bet on the ad market. Oh, is it the oldies radio station? Uh, it is not. You are you are frozen out. Oh, uh, far. <laughs> So it could be you, but certainly not Paddy Power. King George the Sixth Chase could make King's Cross uh, and don't take a bet on the ad market. I'm sorry, I'm going to freeze myself out as well. Uh, <laughs> this is the news that The Guardian has banned gambling advertising from its publications. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, gambling is a huge, uh, That's a, incredible. A, a huge driver for lots of media, particularly particularly sports media. Um, are they biting the hand that feeds them or is this a, a good thing for them to do? It's definitely morally a good thing for them to do. But if you do bite the hand that feeds you and your business dies as a result, then that's not so great. I mean, is it something that TV channels should, uh, should follow suit with? I mean, I think morally it's a good thing to do. Mm. At Intelligence Squared, we've turned down many opportunities to actually make money um, on those grounds. Um, and it's a difficult call, though, because mm. you do put your organisation in a difficult mm -hmm. position. Uh, well, I think Farah, you've just won that. So congratulations, Liz. Again, you have failed to win the, 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 the quiz. I'd say it's a draw. Uh, no, at least I'm consistent. Uh, but, but as a prize, you get to just uh, you get to decide what the media podcast gambling policy is, so you can come away with a big document. <laughs> oh, I'm glad uh, I don't have to do that. Uh, and that would be great. So well done. Uh, thank you to you both. Um, where can people keep up with uh, what you're up to? Liz? Well, I'm still involved with the Expert Women Project, and we have a website, and we're going to have hopefully a big conference next year after ten years of campaigning for more women experts on the news. I have a horrible feeling it probably rose to a peak in around 2015 and certainly in the pandemic it was women overboard as usual so um, yeah I think so it's gone back what's the website back. address? it's um, Expert Women Project and Farah how can people keep up with what you've been doing? Uh, just go to intelligencesquared.com. Uh, we are a live events and podcast business. So you can find our podcast search for Intelligence Squared or the new one, Versus, which is VS. And uh, if you're in London and want to attend any of our live events in person, check out our website. Uh, brilliant. Thank you both.